This is the Fire Dog Podcast. The views and opinions presented on today's episode are those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or the United States Air Force. Welcome, my name is Matt Wilson. I'm here with Ben Perry, and thank you for joining us for part one of episode 16 of the Fire Dog Podcast. Our guest for this two-part episode has been the Air Force Fire Service for 29 years. He served in multiple locations, varying capacities throughout his career, and in 2018, he was hired as the Air Force Fire Chief. In part one, he talks with us about where he served, firefighting foam replacement, when we can expect PFOS blood testing for firefighters, and the future of the EMS program. Please welcome Chief Jeff Wagner. Welcome, Chief. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you. Appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, great to have you on. Chief Morris's episode was a hit, and so we're excited to have you on and you know, share your insights into what goes on at the Pentagon, what's going on in the career field. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, the bar has been set high. <laughs> <laughs> so many of our listeners know who you are, but could you give us a quick, quick introduction on how long you've been in and where you served? Yeah, for sure. So uh, 29 years overall uh, in fire service. I uh, came in the military uh, from Oregon, um, where I, w- I was born in Oregon, raised in Alaska. Um, entered the military back in 91. Uh, spent probably two two years and change over in Misawa, uh, PCS to Seymour Johnson. That's where I ended up transitioning over to the civilian side after about uh, four and a half four and a half, five years of service in the military, uh, crossed over to the dark side and came a civilian. Uh, I ended up spending overall combined 18 years there at Seymour. Uh, so that's been the majority of my career. Uh, I moved uh, PCS from there. Uh, I had gone up through AC of Ops at Seymour, uh, moved over to Lakenheath as the assistant chief of prevention there. And from there, I took the deputy chief's job at Mountain Home and ended up going to kind of an oddball assignment at the personnel center, working at the CE career field team, doing career development for uh, civil engineers broadly. Um, And then went into a degree program at the end of that assignment, a master's degree program in residence. So uh, spent some time there at UTSA. Uh, working on my master's degree, and then into this job back in 2018. So July of 2018, I think it was coming up, coming up on the two year mark in this position. Yeah, that's what you and I were talking about before we pressed record. Two years and it's flown by. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's amazing. It's amazing looking back at you know the things, the things that you thought were true walking into the job versus you know the way you see things playing out now. It's it's kind of eye-opening to watch that happen yeah we're i'm excited to pick your brain a little bit on that to get that pentagon perspective <laughs> absolutely that high you know that higher level stuff sure. so you spent four years in the military correct yes sir it, it's impressive that you you made it to the air force fire chief position obviously i mean it's the highest position in our career field you don't typically see civilians kind of climb the the rungs of that hierarchy to the, to the top top unless they maybe retired out of the military. What was it that you did that was different that kind of allowed you or gave you the opportunity to get that job? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. So I think probably being able to do that is has been primarily just being unafraid to take unusual assignments. You know, so in the military, you're just you're you know it's kind of built into you that you have a new assignment every two, three, four years. You bounce from job to job. Uh, DSD has built in the ability to kind of broaden uh, your experience base outside of the functional stovepipe, um, you know, which is good for a lot of folks. Um, you know, and that but that's no less true for civilians. So broadening that experience base. And getting outside of that stovepipe is important. Uh, so I think that was one of the things that kind of helped me, uh, you know, move through the rungs to get to where, you know, to get to this seat, really. Um, you know, not being scared to take those odd assignments, going to work for the personnel center, for example. That's, a, you know, um, when at the time I took the position, I was the only firefighter that had ever worked on the career field team there. Um, and part of that schedule based, part of that's pay based, but 
uh, even in CE, they had never actually went out looking for a firefighter to bring onto that team. So um, it was kind of a unique opportunity to get there and uh, to get the behind the scenes look. And that helps you, you know, kind of widen your aperture when you're looking at, you know, what is next and what should be next. And, you know, really what does right look like uh, when you're talking about fire in the broad scope of civil engineering, you know, and, and, you know, moving up that into the A4 world. Chief Thompson, we talked to him a couple episodes ago. He he mentioned kind of similar to what you mentioned that he moved around a little bit. And I think, you know, that, that probably gave him the opportunity to, to move into a fire chief position eventually. So you got to be unafraid to take those unglamorous jobs sometimes. Mm, and For sure. And ho- hopefully the, the family is okay with it too, because I know that's a big part of it for a lot of people. Oh. So your, your wife was okay with moving around a little uh, bit? It initially, yes. <laughs> here, here in this last move, this was uh, uh, when we were in San Antonio. Uh, she was very, very clear that this was the last move we were making. So it's, it's this or done. So she was, uh, I think she's ready to quit bouncing around, you know, because that's, you know, like you say, that's important. And we're finally uh, within a day's, a day's drive of the grandbabies. So um, it's important to get close to home and get grounded, you know, back into what, what that after, after life is going to look like. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, not even so much taking the oddball jobs outside of a base, but, you know, being willing to stretch your legs inside the station as well. Um, you know, very few people enjoy, uh, jumping out into prevention or safety, for example, uh, you know, or even dispatch for that matter. You know, most firefighters want to ride trucks. We want to go rip around on the fire trucks and drive fast on base and do all the cool stuff. Uh, prevention doesn't have that, you know, part of it. Uh, safety doesn't have that part of it, but it's a very important part of the department that helps you spread that aperture a little bit wider to get your experience wider. Yeah. And in ops is, I don't want to say it's the easy stuff. It's not the easy stuff, but it's important to get into those positions like dispatch and prevention and health and safety, like you mentioned, because when you do make it to the higher level of the hierarchy, uh, that's that's a lot of the decisions that you have to make are based around those those programs or those uh, sections of the department. Absolutely. Yeah, we talk about that at 427 sometimes that, you know, the as a chief or a deputy, the things that will consume your time are, are typically not operational related. You know, they're HR related. They are, you know, prevention related. They're, you know, helping your prevention chief argue whether or not uh, a sprinkler system is needed in a facility. Those are, those are the what things that tend to consume your time and, and finding money and, and resources. Those are, uh, it's typically not the ops stuff that, that burns your time down once you start into those management roles. So, Chief, I'd like to kick off our main discussion with a topic I'm sure you're excited to talk about, PFOS and PFOA. <laughs> so, where are we at with foam replacement and where are we at with the PFOS blood testing for firefighters? Uh, two, two good questions. Um, so I'll take them one at a time. Uh, the easy one is the PFOS blood testing. So we've got uh, across DOD, of course, folks know that there's a a mandate in this last NDAA that requires DOD to test firefighters' blood for PFAS. So that sounds simple on the surface, uh, but once you start messing around with the OCH Health world and uh, start talking to toxicologists to figure out what exactly are we testing for, so you know, kind of on the front end of this. So PFAS, P-F-A-S, is actually a family of about 4,000 different variations of, of chemical. Um, currently, the capacity to test only includes uh, six or seven of those thousands. So it's it's difficult to say you're going to test for PFAS when the test doesn't necessarily exist. Um, So the other challenge with that is uh, something that I had not considered, but simply defining who's a firefighter. You know, for us, it's easy. You know, three E7s are firefighters, 0081s are civilian firefighters. 
but do we test contract firefighters? You know, what about folks that work at the, the, the primary ranges that also do firefighting, but that's not what their primary job is? You know, do we include them or do we not include them? The Navy has damage control men, uh, but they treat everybody on board as a firefighter in the event of an emergency. So, you know, where do those lines get drawn? That was that took quite a bit of time for the Oc Health folks to hammer through where we're not. Um, we don't have a different answer for every service. Uh, you know, one of the other challenges was what happens if we have somebody in DSD? You know, if they're if they're a uh, recruiter today, their primary AFSC is not 3E7. So how do we capture those folks? Uh, you know, and do we need to? Uh, people that cross train, uh, retirees, you know, and, and the answer where that line is drawn uh, was pretty substantial to get to that point. But we've got that, we've got all the data pulled, and we're ready to uh, start executing that. They anticipate somewhere, somewhere in the September range starting that. Uh, I think their expectation at one point was to simply connect it to your AUC health exam, your annual exam. Uh, but I think now maybe they're probably going to do some broad testing uh, to get it to get it jammed out in this uh, fiscal year. So that's kind of the easier of the two <laughs> two part question there. So where was the line drawn? So yeah, we took uh, we ended up capturing all of the. Active duty, three E7s uh, as a primary or secondary AFSC. So if you've got that, if you're currently in a DSD assignment, we should have caught all of those folks. Uh, all of the current 0081 civilians, uh, but we did not go backwards through um, old series with civilians just because it's a difficult, it's a more difficult line to catch. So... Uh, I think our expectation is as this moves forward, uh, we'll be able to refine this more and more. The contractors was kind of an odd line because we had to look at who provides their annual AUC physical. If the Air Force or DOD provides it, then we would then provide that uh, blood testing. If that was through a, uh, a third party or someone off base, then we would not be providing that currently. Um, so th there's some some weirdness in there. We didn't reach back into the retirees just because of the the nightmare that that would be to try and A, find them, B, get them somewhere reasonable to test um, and and get that back. Uh, so so I think we've, we've settled on what's probably a 99% solution right now. Um, and it's gone off to the testing labs to sort out. They've got regional testing labs that they're going to push that through. I remember when we watched you speak in December at AFIT, you talked about the fact that you don't know what level is bad and what level is not bad right. when it comes to PFOS. So if we get results back come September, are we going to know whether it's bad? So so no. The, the short answer is that that still has not changed. Science and and that whole community, that whole research community has not caught up to um, – where we're sitting at right now. So I can give you a level, say you have 300 parts per trillion in your blood. Um, that may be a bad thing. That may not be a bad thing. We don't know. Um, and there's plenty of disagreement amongst the scientific community about what that looks like. So the EPA is looking at it. They also got some um, mandates out of the... Uh, uh, out of the last Congress, and, and I expect more will come. So we will get to a point where they start defining what those critical levels are. But today, uh, they just don't have solid data to say, you know, whether a 300 or a 200 or a, a 9,000 is, is the bad line, and, and then what that will even do. So that's been one of our concerns broadly across DOD is even if we get these tests, you know, the, the next question is, so what? You know, if everybody in your fire station gets tested and one person pops a 6,000 and everybody else is down in the hundreds, you know, 
does that person start making life choices based off of that 6,000? You know, there's, there's a lot of tail to this that we, we want to make sure we're, you know, we're a doing the right thing for all the firefighters, but B uh, you know, we're giving you a frame of reference for what that actually means. And then eventually when they actually figure out the number scale and what it really means, they can go back and find those that have been identified high and Absolutely. address it accordingly. Absolutely. Yeah. So the intention is as more and more of this data comes out, you know, we keep an open flow of information. Uh, FES is, we are a part of that. And I try to be as open as possible with things that we're allowed to talk about. Uh, but the OC health community is very much aware of this and, and very much um, turned on to making sure folks have the, the latest up-to-date information because, it, you know, it matters, you know, it matters in your your life, your health, your family. Where are we at with foam replacement? So that's a, a very big topic. Um, and sadly, there, there are many parts of this that I can't talk about uh, just because of the mandate we're under with uh, uh, the PFOS task force that the Secretary of Defense uh, established. So once that started, it started a whole lot of wheels moving. Uh, and one of those wheels in particular was related directly to us with the replacement of AFFF. Um, so we have right now across DOD, there are over 13 labs that are working on trying to identify a replacement. They're testing uh, existing fluorine free firefighting agents, uh, defining what, those, what that criteria is you know the current mill spec has uh, a lot of performance criteria in it but we're we're also looking at is that the right criteria because a lot of things have changed over the years with regards to uh you know simple things like we switched from jp4 to jp8 you know that's seems like a relatively simple thing but you know that dramatically changed our risk profile uh, with aircraft, with hangars, with all the things that are to do with jet fuel. So uh, we never accounted for that because we were using the same product that we had, you know, that we had, it has existed since the 60s. So, um, you know, we're just looking at to make sure that if we're saying, uh, you know, a, a viscosity level or a, a firefighting time criteria, um, is at a certain level that that it needs to be there. You know, currently the the burn back resistance rating uh, is 360 seconds right now in the current middle spec. But you know, I would argue that that I don't know that that is the right level. You know, I don't think that 360 seconds is a relevant uh, measure for burn back because six minutes of safety time. Uh, I would argue we're not leaving the scene. You know, we don't have six minute gaps almost ever, you know, in, in uh, firefighting where that would be a relevant measure that, that changes the dynamic of the fire we're fighting. So is it three minutes? You know, I don't know, you know, but we, we've tried to define that and we've pushed that to the research folks to help uh, kind of fine tune what that criteria should be. Um, because there's a lot of moving parts with that. Viscosity, uh, some of the fluorine-free agents that have been tested uh, have the vicos viscosity of jelly, you know, literally grape jelly that you have to pre-mix to then get into the pumps to get out. And those, uh, some of the better ones that we've found, uh, for example, will put out a 28-square-foot pan fire in 51 seconds. You know, which doesn't seem like a whole lot of time, but AFFF does the same job in 30. So we, we defining the scope of what those performance criteria need to be is, is a very difficult part of this right now. Um, finding uh, the right agent that works with our trucks that has um, the resistance to uh, rust and and ecological risk you know we don't want to have um, 
buyer's remorse, you know, 10 years from now, I'd rather not be the target of a social media campaign to say, you know, what the heck was Wagner thinking? You know, why did we end up with this product? I think that's inevitable, well, Chief. Thanks. <laughs> I think everybody, everybody, whoever the fire chief happens to be, is probably going to take some right. take some flack right. at some point. Absolutely, and I'm okay with that. But you know, I, I want us to make good decisions on the front end as best we can. You know, with good information um, that doesn't put us in a position where, you know, we have buyer's remorse years from now. Um, but but on the balance of that, you know, the environmental side can't be the main driving criteria, because at the end of the day, there's risk involved in what we do. There's risk in firefighting. So um, we can't reverse some of the, the damage that happens, but we can certainly you know, mitigate that risk to extents. Balance it against, you know, firefighter exposure, Absolutely. You know, its capability on the fire ground, long-term effects. I mean, all that stuff. Absolutely right. So, so that's, that's critical that we not just focus on one part of this and, and go running off with our hair on fire to say, you know, oh my God, it can't, it can't have any adverse, you know, ecological impact. You know, we still need it to do, do a job and, you know, it needs to do that job well. So it sounds like we're in the research stage still. Is there a timeline that, yeah. that is there a target date to have foam replaced? Yes, sir. So the NDAA says we can't procure fluorine-based uh, firefighting agents uh, after October of 2023, and we can't use fluorine-based firefighting agents after October of 2024. So our hard deadline is 2024, um, which seems like a good ways out. That's four years. But in the grand scheme of looking at this, the product today does not exist. Now, who's doing the research on this, Chief? Is this the Air Force or industry? So, so yes, <laughs> Air Force is Air Force Research Lab is is working on this. Uh, the Navy Research Lab uh, is working on this. We have academia, we have manufacturers. Um, everybody's working towards um, this fix. It's like so, the space race, but for foam. Right. So, so <laughs> whoever that's, gets there that, first. It's, it's interesting you say that because that was one of the things that Dr. Esper mentioned when he first stood up this PFOS task force. He said, we put a man on the moon in 10 years. There's no reason you can tell me we can't swap away from this product in less than that. You know, so it, it's, <laughs> that's an interesting connection you made there. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not unrealistic and, and it's not an unreasonable thing to ask. Pressure is the great motivator in the world. You know, I mean, uh, having a deadline will do wonders for technology and advancement in almost any field. Right. Absolutely true. Um, but we also have to understand that we're working in the scope of, you know, we're the DOD, you know, so we've got all of the rules that we have to follow for, you know, simple things like procurement and, and um, you know, all of the different frames of things that, that apply, you know, and put that pressure on us. You know, I can't just go out, if, if, even if I had a product today that I could say brand X is the winner. This is, this is an amazing product and that's the one we want. We can't just go walk out and say, that's the only one I want. You know, we have to compete it. We have to meet all the acquisition rules. We have to go through that entire process um, because really, you know, this is, you know, only halfway jokingly, whoever gets the right product wins, you know, and they win a lot, you know, several million dollars worth of uh, Air Force procurement and Navy and Army and every, you know, all of the DOD entities added on top of the FAA, who's also, they also mandate mil-spec AFFF right now. So we have uh, in the DOD, we have about 3,000 ARF trucks uh, that are using AFFF right now. The FAA has uh, 1,100 airports, give or take, and they've got over 6,000 trucks that are using this stuff. Um, and then what, if you want to expand the aperture even further, uh, NATO countries also mandate mil-spec AFFF. So you've got 27 different countries. So whoever gets the winning golden ticket you know, is, is going to make a whole lot of sales very, very quickly. 
So, you know, we're, we're cognizant of that, that, that this is a, a very far reaching uh, question. So we've included the FAA. They're also doing research. They've got a, a brand new test facility up in New Jersey that we're using as well. So we're trying to stay as lockstep as we can all the way across the board. So there's a lot of folks working on all different parts of this. Well, moving on from one kind of contentious subject to the next, probably one of the most asked about things that we hear about here on the show is the EMS program. People are so curious about what the near and long-term um, plans are for the EMS in the fire service. So could you give us an update? I know we just heard from Chief Morris a few weeks ago, but uh, you know, a lot can change in a few weeks and you may have a different perspective. So we'd love to hear that. Raj. Yeah, no, that's good. Good question. That's a, that's one of the things that, you know, anytime you take a new job, you have a short list of things that you want to get after and things that you, you look at the grand scheme and say, this is broken and this is what I want to fix. And this EMS has been one of those for me. Uh, when I came in to this job, this was one of the things that I wanted to fix uh, definitively one direction or another. We're in or we're out. Um, so I, I was lucky enough coming in that uh, Chief Rickard had already started the wheels turning and Chief Matlock down at uh, AFCAC we had gotten to the point where we could take EMT back into the fire stations. So we made, you know, that was a, a pretty significant success for FES. So for me, it was, you know, kind of stepping in on the tail end of that win, you know, to say, okay, eight EMTs per station. And we had met out in uh, uh, Nellis back in, I guess it was August of 18. So I was only in the job maybe a month. Uh, when we were talking about this. And during that time, we had started the discussion with some of the Surgeon General folks uh, at that time about, hey, what, what if we take this completely? What does that look like? You know, fire-based EMS, is that the right answer? And, uh, you know, we kind of kicked it around a little bit, but didn't settle on anything, you know. But the door was open, and it was interesting that the door was open. So uh, fast forward a little bit, we've been working, uh, we've got some folks in fire uh, that we've been including in these working groups to try and help shape what it is, what do we even want this to look like? Um, you know, it's not just as simple as saying, okay, every base, you know, go down to the med group and pick up the keys to the ambulance, you got it. Uh, there's training required behind that. There's resourcing behind that. There's uh, positions, you know, because we can't just, you know, one of the things that I refuse to do is drop this extra mission, extra task into a department without the right resources to manage it. So uh, it's it's difficult to shape that because we don't know what that looks like on our side, right? Uh, so that's kind of what we've been doing most recently, as we've started working down uh, the questions, we've had a couple of meetings. We've had I've had several meetings, but uh, we've had a couple of in-person, face-to-face meetings with the SG and fire folks. And most recently, we had one here towards the end of last summer in DC, where we got uh, Terry Ford, uh, some of the SG folks, and we brought you know Fred Terran. We brought some of the folks you know that that are familiar with these programs and put us all in a room and said, okay. You know, what do we need? What questions do we have to ask? What what data points do we need to see? How do we shape this to even ask the question? Um, so we've gotten uh, notional agreement from the three star level at the on the SG side and the A4 side to say, yeah, we, we like the concept. Uh, explore it. Define it. And, and come back to us with what that actually looks like. So we're looking at resources, um, that questionnaire that went out, uh, the data call that went out a few months ago, that's what that was shaped around, was to try and find the correct data points to be able to evaluate a base and say, um, do you need one ambulance or do you need three ambulances? Is that 
five five extra bodies or is that 25 extra bodies you know what kind of resources what kind of mutual aid do you have nearby uh, can you meet the 12 minute response time for ALS or not so you know just grabbing that giant mass of data so that we can start grinding that down to say okay it it looks like you know, at this base, they need one BLS ambulance. They can rely on mutual aid for the ALS part of that because it meets their time requirement, you know, and kind of boil it down to say, okay, five bodies, two ambulances, and, you know, $30,000 a year nets a BLS capability in, you know, FES, in that flight. So shaping what that looks like at each of those flights is kind of where we're at with trying to figure that out so that we can go back to um, the three stars and say, you know, here, here's what this is going to cost. You know, this is 535 FTEs. This is, you know, $70 million a year. This is, you know, um, 500 ambulances, whatever those numbers break down to, uh, you know, to make a good decision to say, yeah, this is something we want to pursue or, you know, now the cost is not right or or it just doesn't seem right um, on either side of this. So broadly, kind of in the long term, the goal is um, to move EMS over into fire um, and to figure out how to do that most efficiently um, where we're not wasting time and time and money and, and dumping work into departments. So this may or may not happen. It's leaning towards may, but correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So, th so there's no guarantees. We still need to make sure that this makes sense uh, financially for us, for SG, you know, cause at the end of the day, you know, you guys, you guys have been around long enough, you know, you know, money makes the world go round, especially in, in federal government. So. Those um, bases that have existing variances for ALS capability, are they going to be able to maintain that? Are they going to be able to train advanced level providers and basic level providers? Sure. So we're not changing any of that right now. We're trying not to rock the boat, uh, especially with this effort. We're trying not to uh, change the existing ground truth out there. So some installations, you know, you're right, some installations have uh, ALS approved. Some some have um, an EMTI or AEMT now uh, capability already built into the installation. So we're trying not to, you know, rock that boat too much uh, until we get some solid answers. But at the same time, you know, we have to be be aware that uh, some fire some fire chiefs and and some SG some med groups are leaning forward saying, okay, well, it's just going to be easier. You guys are taking it anyways here, you know, here's the ambulance. Uh, so we're being very, trying to be very, very sensitive to that, that, <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't just take this over, you know, and, and hope everything works out. Is there any consideration to how it's going to work um, in some unique places like overseas, right? In Europe where, Maybe your structure is a little different. Your off-base providers might be at a different level than your uh, typical stateside ALS coming from off-base might be. Yep, absolutely. So that's we've got a whole uh, section in our working group that's that's going to be their entire focus is what that looks like overseas because even even something as simple as saying what it looks like overseas is not that simple. You know, Korea is going to be a different answer than Japan. It's going to be a different answer than the Germans, than the the Italians. The, you know, it's it's going to be a a very broad answer. Um, you know, and in some cases, it may not make sense to transition it. You know, it may it may make sense just to leave that you know over at the med group in overseas locations where they have four ends currently organically providing that level of service. You know, maybe we just leave it alone. You know. Um, in garrison stateside is a significantly easier answer than, you know, overseas. And then multiplying that with looking at downrange, um, you know, how do we function? How do we function when we deploy? You know, if you go to, you know, Ali, um, you know, who's providing that level of care there? You know, is it us? You know, so we've, we've had some 
very spirited debates about what those things should look like and who should be providing those things, you know, and, and that's good. You know, it's, it, it's encouraging to me that everybody is emotional about this because it means they care. And it means at the end of the day, everybody cares about who's, who's providing that best level of care to the folks out walking around on the base. I don't want to sit here and, and trample on the medical group at all, but <laughs> I will say that in my experience, my time in, I've seen a noticeable difference between medical group providers and firefighters. And I chalked it up to, we are in the emergency service business. They are in the clinical practice business. And I think there's a noticeable difference with that. In, in my experience, I've seen a noticeable difference. I'm not saying they're not capable of being emergency providers. They just don't have, they don't think in, at the same pace or the same sense of urgency, it seems in some, you know. I, you know, I think you're right that maybe in, a, in the experience realm, they uh, sometimes have had less emergency response practice um, on an individual basis than we may have. But I would put their training above a lot of our training. Um, when it comes to the preparatory elements of emergency response, their level of EMT training that they get in the constant churn of of practice in that realm, I'm envious of that um, at a few of the places that I've seen. And so maybe maybe we meet in the middle. Right. So so that's both both good points. Um, so having uh, you know Matt, you make a good point. They're 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 clinicians, you know, that's what they're, we train them as four and O's uh, to the EMT plus level. So they get extra training, they get extra stuff, they get, you know, they, they've got amazing training. Uh, but then once they go to the installation, typically what happens is they're put in a clinic and they're, they're engaged with patients. They're, you know, that's their day-to-day -day grind. And then you know, 911 rings, and they have to then disconnect from that, change gears mentally completely, you know, to then come out and run around and play with us, you know, where we're sitting, you know, our day to day is, is nothing but preparing for that emergency response. We don't have that clinician job that takes our time uh, on the front end of this. So, you know, I think you're both absolutely correct that, you know, their training is amazing. You know, I would love to figure out a way to tap into that, you know, as we're building firefighters, you know, firefighter EMTs, firefighter uh, advanced EMTs, paramedics, whatever that level looks like, to find a way to tap into that 4-0 pipeline to get that level of training. Um, you know, because I think that's, you know, broadly, the, the point is one of the reasons we're looking at this in the first place is, you know, it's very difficult for them to, to make that disconnect, you know, and, and, you know, we've, we've all seen it and, you know, um, you know, you end up with folks that show up, you know, on scene and it's not that they don't, you know, I mean, these, these are smart people, you know, and they're, they're quality trained and, and, you know, they're just not positioned, you know, they're not positioned for success to do just this job. Their position to be successful as a four and O, not necessarily, you know, an EMT riding a box. So we're we're very sensitive to that. And and the training thing is, you know, that's a very valid point because if we turn this light switch today and said, okay, fire owns EMS, on your market set, go. There's going to be a reduction in level of service and care for the installation. And that's on SAT. So figuring out how how we avoid that drop in level of care is is one of the very critical parts of this because you know we can't have that we can't have you know a a certain level of ability just evaporate because we've moved this over into FES. So we've explored all kinds of different options with you know is it easier to you know take a paramedic. Uh, that exists over in the 4NO community, is there any mechanism whatsoever for us to cross-train that person into fire so that we don't lose that experience, that level of training? That, you know, I mean, there's some, you know, if we, if we 
like I say, if we light switch this, we have the potential of losing a stunning amount of experience. And, you know, you can't just grow a paramedic. You know, that's a, for us, that's, you know, what, an 18 month course. So there's, there's a lot of time that has to go into, you know, that, that light switch better be flicked awful slow. <laughs> Thank you for listening to part one of this episode of the Fire Dog Podcast. You can find more content just like this regularly posted to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash the Fire Dog Podcast. That's facebook.com forward slash the Fire DAWG Podcast. You can also now find us on LinkedIn and Instagram. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast with your friends and coworkers. This is host Matt Wilson with co-host Ben Perry and Chief Jeff Wagner. Please tune in next time for part two of this episode scheduled to release on Sunday, June 7th, 2020. Until next time, stay safe.